Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Till, your host for Our Town, the podcast, a KCQ public television show. And with me today, guest co-hosting is Amarachi Iwakwe. She has been our intern, but more than that, she has been a phenomenal colleague, uh, learning how to do all this stuff and adding such an incredible talent to this work. Thank you so much for being here, Amarachi, again. Thank you. And this podcast covers important topics across the community in Rochester. It lifts up and um, shares organizations and business experiences and other happenings uh, within the community. Today, we have Captain Jeff Stilwell from the Rochester Police Department, and we'll be discussing community policing. This is very prevalent in our world today, and we felt it was a really important topic to cover um, and have uh, Amrashi here as well helping with the question. So welcome, Captain Stillwell. Well, thank you so much for having me. Okay, so the first question is, because this is the first time we're meeting, what is your role at the Rochester Police Department? Well, I'm the captain that uh, is in charge of the community services team. Uh, this is a new team and a new position that Chief Franklin created shortly after his arrival, uh, which deals with all our community engagement activities, uh, our police officers in the schools, in the hospital, in the downtown area, and, and uh, who else do we have? We also have parking control and animal control. So a lot of our, in our community action team, a lot of our outward uh, non-traditional policing, some people would say, uh, relationship building, uh, is handled, uh, uh, starts in my division and, and then moves out to patrol in the other teams. Okay, so are you all connected to the downtown government center or are you in the new building in Northwest? We are actually in the new building uh, okay. or about uh, a little over half of my team works out of this building. I do have some staff that report down downtown, uh, but including the officers that will be patrolling the downtown beat as the downtown opens back up in the coming days. Okay, I think Amarachi and I need a tour. <laughs> for sure, for sure. That's Come on so up cool. anytime. Awesome. Um, well, we know that the Black Lives Matters movement has brought um, community policing and discussions about how policing is done to the forefront. We think it's a really important topic to cover. Um, and I'm wondering if you could tell us the difference between, if there's a difference between police reform and community policing and what is that? Well, I think there is a difference. I mean, I think good police officers have done community policing uh, back to the 60s. I think what we're having to do now, uh, based on uh, a variety of issues, uh, including an increase uh, in, in diversity in this community, is relook at how we police. And, and really what we spend our time on is uh, because we have the time. That's one of the, the benefits of our, our division being s separated out is, is to really dig deep into some of these ongoing disparities that are happening in the community. And, and again, so community policing has been around. I think making sure everybody's voice is heard is my day job. It's what I do every day. Uh, and, and again, so police reform you know, I, I like to say it this way, you know, what, what we believe here is that all people deserve respect, dignity, security, and justice. And we work hard every day to ensure that and get better at that. And our work will not be, um, we don't believe legislative action or inaction will slow us in the fight for a more equitable and just Rochester. So uh, the reform piece helps in, in some regards, but again, most of it is just the right thing to do and we're already doing that or we're already trying to do that. I tell everybody, you know, my job is to focus on the 10 to 15% of residents of Rochester that don't trust the police. Uh, we have a very good, in the community in general, we have a lot of support and trust, but I have the time to meet with those people that have had bad experiences with the Rochester Police Department and explore ways that we can make those better next time. Well, 
It's been a year since George Floyd's death. His death brought about our nation's reckoning with racial injustice and police reform. As a citizen and captain, what have you learned and unlearned during this past year? Well, I think I've learned about, uh, we weren't as far along uh, on this journey as we'd hoped. Uh, it certainly brought that out. It brought back the urgency in trying to do a lot of the things we have been trying to do here through a pandemic has been difficult, but it has recommitted us. I've learned to listen a lot more uh, and not try to, um, you know, sort of argue about those things don't happen here or, but just really listen to people's lived experience and the, and the ongoing trauma they feel when each of these events uh, happen. And, you know, I've really learned to try to, 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 to focus when we meet on all the things we have in common. And, and, and in a world where everybody wants to point out everybody's differences, we've uh, engaged in this community liaison position uh, to first hear each other, to try to do some restorative justice and listening uh, and secondly, to focus on our commonalities and how we can build a better community uh, by understanding each other. So I, I've done a lot of listening over the year, uh, probably more listening than I have in 25 years in this profession. So um, it, it's been really rewarding. I think we're making great strides uh, to make this a better place for everybody in the community. Yeah, and there is a tense historical relationship between the black community and the police enforcement. What have you done, the department done to rebuild trust, particularly with this community in Rochester and what has been the results? Well, I think one of the things we've done is we've published a blueprint for reimagining uh, the Rochester Police Department, which at least gives people an idea of the things we're trying to do. I think we've, we've worked and we have a lot of work to do on transparency. It, admitting when we're wrong. It's not a profession that likes to do that. It's a profession that needs that more than ever right now. Uh, and, and, and again, just coming to some common understanding uh, of, of um, you know, how we're all just out there trying to get through this life and re reach our full potential. And, and uh, we have really taken a focus on not being a block to people reaching their full potential, particularly when we're dealing in the schools or we're dealing with uh, a homeless population or something like that. Oftentimes police, through a system that sends them to every problem, whether they're committed to or trained properly to handle it or not, is supposed to be the solution. And oftentimes we're creating roadblocks. Uh, so we've worked on uh, trying to be a bridge to services, being a resource in the community because in the middle of the night, we're the only resource there that's around. So we get called a lot for things. So, so, so that's really been our focus. How do we not provide new barriers for people that are struggling? How do we build partnerships with community and community organizations to get people the services they need to reach their full potential? And earlier, you mentioned the community liaison program. How's that been going? And could you talk more about it? Sure. Uh, again, COVID's hampered us. Uh, I have known Bud Whitehorn for over 20 years. Uh, uh, at times, we weren't on the same side of the problem-solving equation, but for the last two, uh, we meet uh, regularly. Uh, we, we have done uh, a series of uh, small group circles uh, where we have met and talked and acknowledged our part in, um, in, in uh, uh, you know, creating problems <laughs> rather than solving them, which is our, our, really what we're all here for. Uh, and, and we've done a lot of listening and Chief Franklin has been uh, at the center of that table as have I, as have many other people at the police department willing to listen. So that program is really uh, just, ready to explode as soon as we can fully open up and do events. We are being very targeted uh, in, in, our, in our making sure we're getting the word to the right people. We are, we've done great events in the past, but what we found is uh, we're mostly getting people that already support us and already trust us. And, and so we are, we are formed a partnership to have events where we can build trust together. And, and again, just make everybody in this community uh, 
sort of be happy when the police show up and, and not afraid uh, that they're not gonna be treated with dignity or respect or they're gonna be hurt. So we believe these one-on-one, -on -one, the grassroots level, that's why we've, we've committed to this is really where this, the change for our community has the most potential. Again, there's definitely a policy piece to this, a legislative piece, uh, but, but we're really trying to get to the grassroots of where young police officers and young, uh, young people from the black uh, and uh, community can get to know each other and realize that, hey, we got a lot more in common. We have just as much in common as we have different. And, and if, we, if we treat each other with dignity and respect, we'll all go home safe at night. And, that, and that's the end goal here. Thank you, Captain Stowell. To build upon, that, upon the, uh, you, what you have shared, um, you know, we do know that experiences are out there where, um, you know, persons of color have experienced, you know, racial bias and been the recipient of, of some harsh treatment. We've seen it in the news and in, in video recordings that capture it, you know, across the news. What changes have been implemented um, in the police recruitment process for RPD and training to eradicate potential um, racial bias? Well, obviously, uh, we're training on that. We're, we're, you know, some of that is stat, state mandated. We're ahead of the curve on that. We're also trying to, to build a, a little bit of a more local feel to that. That's part of the the starting point for these restorative circles. Is is, you know, sort of getting a local feel to to how community here has worked. Um, you know, our we've changed policy, the hiring process. Something I'm intimately involved in. We ch totally changed the, the focus to find people with lived experience. Again, what we found is there were barriers, everything from you know, charging somebody to take a test to apply for a job here on that put unnecessary barriers to getting a diverse workforce here. So, so we're thoroughly committed to increasing that. We've given less and less uh, um, credit, I guess you would say, for previous experience. Again, we, we value lived experience just as much because what we're finding is that um, uh, previous uh, experience, uh, particularly in a system that hasn't worked for everybody, is sometimes we're having to spend a lot of time untraining bad habits that you might have learned somewhere else. So uh, we are committed to a hiring process and we have hired some really really wonderful people over the last two years that uh, our, for our previous processes, they would have never even got a second interview. So uh, we're pretty proud of that. It's a struggle right now. Uh, a lot of what you hear in the media is affecting particularly applicants of color uh, from uh, really being sure they want to join this profession. But we, we believe that all this works hand in hand. If we if we can prove that Rochester is an in inclusive community, that we have a police department that values equity and justice, that we will we will start drawing people from other places to come here to work, and we're and that is our goal. You know, I spoke about the videos that have been out in the media that we've seen. George Floyd was absolutely traumatic seeing that happen, and I know some other um, colleagues and and police officers that unified in their feedback that what happened to George Floyd was unnecessary. It was too much. The general public has called for banning of certain neck restraints and reforming the use of force uh, during arrest. Can you speak about changes that may be done in this area in Rochester at all? Yeah, I think we've already restricted the neck restraint to only in a situation where deadly force would be authorized. So if the if you have two choices, one is some type of neck restraint and two is shoot and shoot somebody, then then that's the only time it's it, it, it's been used. We couldn't find a neck restraint case here in like the last two years. It's not a technique that we've really used a lot around here. Um, uh, you know, I think the, they had the eight things that couldn't wait. We've done all those. Uh, again, I think we we were working down this road probably before uh, George Floyd got murdered, but since then we've just sort of redoubled our efforts. So all those things uh, were, were uh, Chief Franklin has been a leader on getting them changed. We haven't resisted a lot of calls from the community for different changes, the ones that we believe are workable and. And so, yeah, I think uh, 
the, the key, you know, sort of is still gets back to that when you treat people with respect and dignity, typically you're not going to have to resort to any use of force, let alone deadly force or, or um, the higher levels of force. So all those things were, were, were training, were teaching de-escalation. We were on the front edge of, of uh, taking our time when dealing with people in mental crisis. Uh, so we didn't have to use uh, force. We have brought in a very robust co-responder model that we're starting to work with our social worker partners, you know, it started with we go together. Now we're starting to triage calls out where the police don't even need to respond. So all those things uh, we're committed to. Uh, we we get super a lot of support from the county in, in the social worker program. We're working on a community paramedic program with mail where where again people, you know, we go to a medical and if it's not life threatening and they don't want to go to the hospital we just leave and now we're getting in a program where we can get follow on care, follow on mental health help, all the things that police really can't solve, but re cause us to repeatedly go to the same places and deal with the same people. We've finally taken the time as a community, not just the police department, to roll some of these things back and start looking for ways to, to exclude us from the equation or the need for us from the, the equation. In previous cases, we've seen some lack of police accountability. So we want to know why is it challenging to hold some police officers accountable and how can we improve police accountability? Well, I think uh, body cams are improving police accountability. I think it's it, it's hard. Uh, uh, you know, we, we, we take it sort of like a, a, a football or sports analogy you know, we don't like to second guess each other. It's the middle of the night on a Friday night. There's all these things, but the reality is we need to. I mean, there's a reason football teams watch tape of their game on Monday morning. It's to get better. And that, that is the attitude and the culture shift that we've really been working on in the last two years is a culture of constant, constant improvement. Maybe you didn't do anything wrong. Maybe you didn't violate a policy, but you didn't really do anything that right either. And how can we do better? So I believe, again, I, I think accountability um, starts, you know, with the look at every event that that doesn't end with a positive outcome. And how could we get it to that? Um, you know, again, I, I've been in this profession actually over 30 years and and it's really, you know, we 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 don't always uh, look at it as a lens of a lot of other industries uh, where, where you know, we don't like to criticize, we don't like to second guess, but that's all changing with body cams, with cell phone videos. Um, the, the police officer today just has to be a lot better in, in continually improving than they were 20, 30 years ago. For more information about this story and other Our Town features, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter at KSMQ hashtag our town or KSMQ.org slash our town. Hi, this is Michael Wojak with your Our Town Rundown. Have you seen any yards that look like they haven't been mowed yet this year? Well, that could be for a very good reason. The city of Rochester has um, introduced a no mow May. Program. And the reason that you might want to choose not to mow in May is that you can really create some important habitat for pollinators like bees. It's not for everybody, but uh, for those of you that are interested in doing it, the city has actually put together a flyer that you can print out and put in your yard so people know that uh, you're not mowing for the sake of just not getting it done, but actually trying to create pollinator space. I tried it for a while, I did break down and finally had to mow. I didn't think my mower was gonna make it uh, through the through it much longer, but uh, every little thing we do to help pollinators is good for the community. A lot of cool events going on. One of the highlights of the summer is when uh, Riverside Live concerts are going on. These concerts are free to the community. Um, some of the ones that I'm looking forward to, uh, Smash Mouth is playing on July 25th, Chastity Brown is gonna be on July 18th, and Felisa on August 1st. Uh, don't sleep on the openers either. There's a lot of local talent that open for these um, national acts and um, I've really enjoyed going out there, enjoying a Sunday evening at Mayo Park uh, with the community and I think we could all use a little bit more of that. 
Some other items that are going on, Broken Family is showing again this weekend. If you're supportive of um, arts that don't fit that traditional Rochester mold, this is a great uh, play that you can go attend. I did it with my wife last weekend. It's going on at Civic Theatre and it's being put on by that theatre company. Uh, Blue Duck is having brunch on Saturday and Remy Mulder will be performing music. And something that I haven't seen posted anywhere that you might like to know about if you're a fan of European football like I am, um, the Champions League final is going to be put on at Grey Duck Theatre uh, by the owner there who is also a soccer fan. I am a big Manchester City fan so I'm looking very much forward to it. And that's just a little bit of what's going on with Rochester. I'll get you one year seems like a second. I wanted to jump in real quick, Amarachi, with a, a question that just popped up in my, my mind. You know, there's transparency in other jobs, whether it be, um, you know, medical care, where, you know, you have these adverse events and you look at it with a transparency lens and really work at, you know, um, creating that change and cultivating that. And sometimes, you know, when having these discussions, I, I see some resistance to modifying some of the technique or strategies that are used. What are your thoughts around that? And do you think Rochester is primed to make these modifications and be more effective so that there's a peaceful de-escalation and end and, and result knowing that there are going to be incidents that are uh, that are risky, that are dangerous, that you know, the police officers certainly need to pr protect themselves too? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that is where that's where we've been going for two years. And in a lot of what we do, uh, again, it, it's about constantly getting better. But but again, we can't, you know, I, I mean, I'm a realist here in that if every time, you know, the answer to every mistake, and I'm the first one to admit all mistakes aren't equal. If there's a loss of life, if there's some of these catastrophic, yeah, it's game over. But when the answer to every mistake is to fire somebody and 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 or have somebody picketing outside their house, uh, that that's not helpful. This profession can't survive um, people not learning uh, through minor mistakes. Let's put it that way, right? Because again, I'm a th firm believer in all mistakes aren't equal. So again, I think it's getting that culture. Uh, again, the biggest thing, the other big thing that we're trying to do here is just ingrain in people you know, the need for officers to intervene because a lot of times these things that go bad are emotional incidents where people have lost control on in whether they're wearing a blue uniform or whether they're not. And it's, it's imperative on their partners and other people to step in and say, stop, you know, and, and, and that's what we're working for. Again, I thoroughly agree with you that this hasn't been an industry where we've been really open to criticism. I mean, we've been open to criticism, but we, we fight it. We always find the reason to defend. It needs to be better. We need to do better than that. There's just no question about it. Um, and, and, and we're working on that every day here. Yeah, that is definitely very key, you know, being open to listening and reanalyzing. So, I also want to like, I would like to hear about um, the blueprint for re-envisioning Rochester Police Department. So how was it drafted? What is in it? Could you describe it? Well, it was drafted because one thing that George Floyd, uh, the George Floyd murder showed us was, is in, in this was nationwide, that we had all these good ideas, but there was never sort of an urgency, I guess, you know, uh, I mean, uh, President Obama's 21st century policing came up with a bunch of ideas that most progressive police chiefs were implementing slowly, right? Because change takes time. Uh, and, and so we had already started down that road. Uh, we wanted an outward looking document that would be a living document that tomorrow, if if there was new priorities or new challenges, we could uh, uh, we could change, but it really was about what we're doing, what we've done in the last two years, what we're continuing to do and what our next steps are. And again, it, it revolves around the five pillars in, uh, in the Obama 21st century policing. Uh, you know, I'll, I won't get them all right if I try to read them off, but, uh, but, but again, a lot of it had to do with transparency and legitimacy. Every day, uh, you know, I ask police officers that are out there, you know, every contact is either going to help us with legitimacy or it's going to hurt us. And for everyone that hurts us, you know, I spend a week or others spend weeks 
trying to rebuild that trust and legitimacy. That is the pillar that I focus on most. Officer wellness is is good for the this the team and everything too, but as are the others. But but again, trust and legitimacy. Um, first, we have to acknowledge it's broken that that there are people that don't trust us. We don't have to acknowledge it was our individual faults. Maybe you know I was. I've never lost any trust or legitimacy if I'm just your average officer. But we have to acknowledge it, and we have to we have to carry that with us when we go out there every night. We have to take uh, account of our implicit biases and the biases of the people that call us to take action against people that may or may not be involved in anything criminal. And we have to police in a way uh, where everybody everybody wins. And, and, and that's a lot of work. None of this is easy. Uh, me and Bud often talk about who's gonna lose the most friends uh, uh, quickest. Again, we're both doing kind of the same thing reaching over a line that hasn't traditionally been crossed and it started with me and him, me and him trusting each other and now it, we have to get it community wide right so so again i think that is the the blueprints on the website again it shows where we're at uh, we know we're not there yet we know transparency is a big issue obviously there's laws about what we can and can't re release and those types of things but we're working uh and again to to build trust and legitimacy, particularly in those spaces where we haven't had any in the past. Captain Stillwell, I think you really bring up a good point about that trust component. And it starts, it started with you and Bud. And now you're trying to, you know, spread that across the community, but but it really calls out that there are community members that that need to be able to trust and have that trust built as well. And so, you know, consistency and actions are, are really key in order to do that. Do you think that there are any misconceptions about policing that you can call out or clear up during our time together today? Well, I think, I, I think what I often spend a lot of time in this, you see this a lot if you followed our interaction with the, the school board. There's a lot of perceptions about what what police are doing that don't happen in Rochester. There's a perception about how we how our officers in the schools, what their job was, and 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 it really wasn't what they wasn't. So we we do spend enough time educating about um, what we actually do here, what's important to us, right? Uh, we actually again we have a very good relationship with most communities, even in some of the marginalized communities that, you know, we, we have a decent history, not great. Uh, so, so again, I think the biggest, uh, the biggest takeaway from that question uh, that I would tell everybody is find out what your police department's doing. If you see they did this in LA or New York or Portland or wherever, ask the question, call us. Is this how you handle these types of incidents? Because what you'll find is, is police agencies are like, all kinds of businesses and agencies. Not everybody does it the same way. Um, and, and again, sometimes I, I don't bring up a lot about the things we do different because uh, again, I'm focusing on the narrow band of things I need. I think we need to change. And I, and I don't wanna make it sound like we're the perfect police department. We have a goal to be a premier law enforcement agency. Every day we work towards that goal. I don't think we're there yet. I, you know, others around here might, but I'm focusing on you know, how do we reach that group that we haven't been able to reach and, and build that trust? Because these incidents aren't happening with cap, police captains and chiefs and community leaders. They're happening with young, uh, lots of times, young officers or young individuals in the community that may, that may not, uh, you know, have 30 years of background in what works and what doesn't. So we have to bring everybody up to speed really fast and we're committed to that. Yeah. How can the community become more engaged with law enforcement to help cultivate sustainable sustainable change? Well, I think what we're finding is is you know communities get better not because we show up, but that work with us and and you know we we've done great things. Not we. I, I don't mean the police. I mean the community in the Meadow Park neighborhood. A, a, an initiative driven by the United Way and uh, and. Um, IMAA, I think, 
uh, again, giving owner ownership might not be the right word, but giving uh, giving people that live in that neighborhood a voice, uh, not just landlords, not just the police, not just city leaders, but the people that live in those neighborhoods. How do you want us to be? How do you want to be policed? How? What is the neighborhood norm here? And and we just did numbers for 2020 and and. The, that neighborhood, the crime numbers in that neighborhood are substantially decreased. And we didn't really do anything different. We showed up for some meetings, uh, but the neighborhood embraced making their neighborhood better. And, and that was always a neighborhood that the police department had sort of viewed as, well, nobody stays, it's sort of transient, a lot of immigrants in that neighborhood, uh, you know, they come and go. But they, we found real leaders. That's what I, every day I look for leaders out there that want to work with us because I know we can't do it alone. We're going to do a, a street, uh, a street advocacy program, sort of uh, like the Mad Dads model, street outreach. Um, we're partnering with some of the groups in this community that are re-entering people from prison, a population we would have ignored for years unless they committed another crime. Well, how about we spend a little time on the front end, uh, helping them re-enter not in the, I'm gonna judge you for what you did before you went to prison, but how can we help you succeed so we don't meet again under bad circumstance? And, and, and you know, all these things, uh, this community is a great community for a hundred different reasons. It doesn't mean it can't get better. And again, it all becomes about relationships. It's all becomes about not marginalizing people because they've been to prison or because, you know, last week, uh, you know, whatever, they were involved in a fight. It's about people knowing people. Everybody uh, succeeds, you know, we all, we all succeed when everybody does better. Uh, and, and, and again, it's really, that's what we're focused on. Uh, you know, we're doing programming all over the place with youth, with people re-entering from prison, with the drug treatment facilities. We're, we're trying to build this into something that is sustainable long after me and Bud, uh, move on to, to, to wherever the next chapter of our lives go. Captain Stowell, thank you so much for being on the show. We appreciate your transparency, your candidness, and really this has been um, a very informative uh, and helpful interview. Really appreciate you. Amarachi, do you have any parting words or anything to say in that regard? I wanted to say thank you for coming on here and really being honest too, like mentioning that that was the part that stood out with me was when you mentioned that the Department of Police Enforcement has been some more resident to being open to criticism. I think that was a good point. And also mentioned that moving forward, don't you guys will appreciate listening and encouraging that. So that was good to hear. Thank you. Thank you so much, Captain. And thanks for tuning in to Arctown, the podcast. This is Danielle Teal, your host, with our last time with Amarachi guest hosting. We're so appreciative of her. Thank you for being here, Amarachi. Thank you. I had a lot of fun on here, and I want to say thank you to you, Danielle, and you, Annie, and everybody else behind the scenes for supporting me, teaching me. And I learned a lot, and I will definitely carry this on with me wherever I go. Oh, well, Thank you're me. always welcome back. Thank you so much. This has been a KSMQ Public Television show. You can catch up with us on Facebook or Twitter at KSMQ, hashtag our town. Hey.